Hello, my name is Jim Parker. For many years, I managed the public lending rights system in the United Kingdom. Public lending right is the right that authors have that when their books are borrowed from public libraries, they get a payment from the government. Now you might think this right has always been there, but it hasn't. It took many years of campaigning by authors to get that right, finally passed in Parliament in 1979. And I'm delighted today to be in conversation with Maureen Duffy. Maureen led that campaign, which, as I said before, was successful in 1979. Maureen, thinking back to those early days in the 1970s when you got involved, what was it that got you first involved in the campaign? Well, it was a combination of things, really. Bridget Brophy's father, had been very active in the campaign. Um, he had an idea of charging for every loan, but charging the borrower. And this was known as the Brophy Penny. Um, and this wasn't really an acceptable idea to uh, most of us who tended to be rather left-leaning mm -hmm. and to think that um, public libraries were a public service and that they should not be charged for. And there was also the whole thing of uh, what appeared in some places as educating our masters, because universal suffrage meant that for the first time, anybody could vote and everybody should vote, but Suddenly, somebody began to think, um, well, who are all these uh, <laughs> nobodies uh, who know nothing about anything? Um, and how can we get them brought up to scratch so that they know what they're voting for and talking about? And so in uh, order to do something about this, uh, they promoted free public libraries. But that was all very well. Unfortunately, uh, it meant that the authors um, were likely to lose out because uh, we were not being paid for this, unlike some of our continental colleagues. And we were very fortunate in that a great friend was a Labour member of the House of Lords, Ted Willis. And Ted was essentially a television writer. And because he was a Labour peer, um, he was the person who could actually begin to advise us on how we should conduct a campaign and help us with it. And by involving other members of the House of Lords and also by introducing um, actual uh, pieces of potential legislation, um, he was able to point us in the direction of building a campaign. We began to uh, gather as many writers as possible mm -hmm. to support us and think, began to think constructively of how we should go about getting what we wanted and what we thought was right. I, I believe you used to have meetings in a, a pub in London and the landlord himself was a, a writer, is, is that right? Yes, um, that was one of my locals, the Queen's Elm, uh, and the landlord was Sh Sean Tracy, and he had written uh, a book about what it was like to be a landlord, and he very kindly allowed us to hold meetings for free in his pub 
and we were able to get lots and lots of writers to come and take part in this. Uh, I suppose partly because it was Chelsea and partly because it was a pub. It, it and, must have obviously struck a chord with writers yes. because you got a lot of people packing into that pub, didn't you? Yes, um, and all sorts of um, people. And you, you mentioned um, Lord Willis, but you and Bridget were, were leading from the front, so to speak. Did, did you have a particular way that you divided the work be between you? I did the people bit, mm -hmm. and Bridget did, as it were, a sort of offshoot literary bit um, in writing articles and making speeches and, and so on, which she was absolutely brilliant at. So. Um, that was how it came about, that we just naturally fell into our separate yes. activities. Yes. Really. And within Parliament, you mentioned um, Ted Willis, who was obviously very supportive, but I had the privilege some years ago of meeting Michael Foote uh, in his retirement, and he, he told me that helping you get PLR was the greatest achievement of his long political career, which was a very interesting thing to, to hear him say. But do you, have, do you have any recollections of working with, with Michael Foote? Well, I mean, yes, um, he was a great intellectual. Um, and mm. he did support us throughout. Um, and, you know, we have to be always, well, really eternally grateful to Michael Foote. And um, so um, the combination of him and Ted was fantastic. Yes. yes. And was it through him that you, you got your meeting with the Prime Minister, Jim Cowagher, at Downing Street? No, that was Ted. That was Ted. Um, and um, we were invited to the Cabinet Office mm. to meet the Prime Minister. And of course, jumped at the offer um, because we had been putting uh, pressure on as many MPs as we and Lords as we possibly could mm. um, to advance the campaign. Um, and so we uh, arrived in the uh, cabinet office and. Uh, the then Prime Minister, James Callaghan, came in and we put our case to him again. And he said, um, well, um, it would help me a lot to help you if you could get the support of the Trade Union Congress. And it so happened that although um, the Writers Guild of Great Britain was a proper trade union affiliated to the Trade Union Congress with the right to make uh, motions and have them debated before the annual Congress um, and to get their support in that way. And so it happened that when uh, the next Congress came round, uh, I don't know quite why it fell to me. Somebody must have thought I was the person to do it. It's your working class credentials. My working, <laughs> yes, probably. My working class credentials, as Jim says. And so I found myself going down to Brighton to address the biggest audience I think I have ever addressed, with the possible exception of the United Nations in Geneva. Um, and <laughs> uh, so I put up our motion and made my pitch. And then there suddenly appeared a librarian to refute it and say, we didn't deserve it, we shouldn't have it, nobody could afford it and uh, it would damage the library system and all sorts of things of that kind. And 
the Congress was running late, as these things always do. <laughs> as ever. <laughs> and so uh, the chairman didn't want me to exercise my right to reply to this. So I leapt to my feet, and the Congress is always divided um, left and right with an aisle down the middle. Um, and I set off down this aisle. And as I went between rows and rows of miners and steel workers and um, laborers of every conceivable kind, I suddenly heard somebody say, go on girl, give it to him. And I thought we could win. And we did. So we were able to go back to the Prime Minister and with TUC support, our motion was accepted and passed. So you've been to the TUC, the campaign was picking up momentum through the 70s. There was still a lot of opposition in the back benches in Parliament. And we get to 1978, a very bad winter for the Labour government. Um, did, did you have a feeling that um, it was important to try and get something through Parliament before the general election that was going to be coming in 1979. Did, were you aware of the, the need to, to get something through Parliament before a possible Conservative government came in? Uh, Jim, I would have to say yes. I mean, um, we, uh, we were opposed by people from both political sides um, in those final debates. We had, up to the very last minute, we had to fight and fight and fight. Yes. At one point, um, we were told that computers would never come in for another 10 or 20 years. And yet we knew that they were already being used at supermarket checkouts. So uh, we didn't accept that one. And so I made contact with an early computer company called Logica, which designed uh, all sorts of schemes and ways of using this new potential. And we got them to draw up a possible scheme. But the librarians were still deeply opposing it, fiercely opposing it. And we realized that we would have to continue fighting and that we would have to make sure that funding came from central government from the arts budget and that the librarian's own money was not touched. Yes. But then there was the huge problem of how to calculate it. Mm. And we began to think round this huge problem because if you had attempted to uh, gather every loan, it would have been absolutely impossible. And so we turned to the idea of a sample. And we engaged a London University statistician. Now that statistician you approached at London University, was that the famous Ron Pluck? It was indeed the famous Ron Pluck. And he uh, devised a geographically reliable sample. Mm -hmm. And I still faintly remember the day he rang up and we said, so what do we need? And he said, a 10% sample will give you a plus or minus 2% 
accuracy. And we thought, that's it, we're there. Because um, that surely would have made it obvious that this was doable. Yes. That it was not beyond um, the wit of man to devise a scheme. And that um, since it was going to be centrally funded, there was no longer any reason for uh, opposition. However, this was almost so the legislation was brought up and passed. And that was the last gasp of the Labour government. Yes. A general election was held and the Conservatives were elected. And Bridget and I were summoned into the Ministry for the Arts. Um, and the arrangement had been that half the money would come from government, from central funding. Um, and suddenly they said, and half can come from the libraries. So they sprung that on yeah. you. And so we said immediately, no. Hmm. We will have your half, but we want nothing from the libraries. Hmm. Because we knew that librarians, quite rightly, would oppose us bitterly if we had no. threatened their <laughs> own funding. So um, eventually we got away with it and look at it was from the beginning and still remains, I'm glad to say, centrally funded. That was an important point of principle, wasn't it? Yes. And it's one that you and I promote when we're traveling the world, encouraging countries to set up PLR. Yes. But it's got to be centrally funded. Yes. Yeah.